So in the second part of our lecture on job analysis, we're going to talk a little bit about the different methods and the process and what that looks like. First thing that we have to recognize and remember um, is that our methods and the measures and assessments that we use doing job analysis have to be reliable and valid. So just as our selection tools have to be reliable and valid, so do our job analysis tools. And that's one of the reasons why I cover measurement issues. Even though it's chapter eight, I cover that before we get into job analysis. Um, again, remember reliable is making sure that it produces the same results regardless of what job it's applied to, that it's consistent across um, tools, it's consistent across the experts who use it, um, and it's consistent over time. It also needs to be valid. Um, we want to make sure um, it, that the job analysis accurately captures the target job, that it captures the, the range of things that go into a job. It doesn't include things that shouldn't be there, and it, in, it includes just about everything that should be in there in the, in the process. So again, the job analysis has to be both reliable and valid. There are a variety of job analysis techniques. The four most common, five most common, are the critical incidence technique, the job elements method, the structured interview, the task inventory, and the structured questionnaires. The critical incident technique basically identifies the behaviors that are considered effective or ineffective um, in a critical part of the job. So what we're trying to assess is when we're doing a critical activity, what is considered ex um, acceptable or effective and what is considered unacceptable or ineffective. And so we want to make sure we have a description, a really clear description of what the effective and ineffective behaviors are so that they are, we can relate them back. So when we see a certain behavior, we can then assess and say that's critical or it's not critical, if that's effective or it's not effective. So we have a good, clear definition of it. Your job elements method, basically um, experts brainstorm on the characteristics of what is considered a successful worker. So you might look at the most successful workers in your company, or you might go to job um, subject matter experts in the field and ask them what is the most what are the most um, important characteristics of successful workers. So you can use subject matter experts outside of the company as well as the job experts in the company. That's probably not a highly common method. I think the critical incidence is probably more common than that, but nonetheless, it's still possible to use. The structured interview technique, again, subject matter experts provide information about the job verbally in a structured interview. So we ask very structured questions, and then they answer those questions, and we develop the structure of the job based on how people answer those questions. The task inventory includes um, uh, experts who create a very big laundry list of tasks and you can come up with that information by going to old job descriptions or going to ONET um, and developing a list of tasks that people need to do, grouping those um, tasks together in major functions, and then having people check off what is involved in their job and what is not involved in their job. And if it's involved in their job, how often did they do it or how important is it to do? Um, the last is the structured questionnaire and involves a, a, using a list of pre-planned questions regarding um, a job. For example, the position analysis questionnaire or the PAQ. So we have pre-planned questions that help us to analyze a job and it's a questionnaire rather than an interview situation. Um, and the goal is that we hand it out to people and people fill out and they answer the questions regarding the different tasks that are involved in that particular job. Just as we use selection tools and we validate selection tools based on the uniform guidelines of employee selection procedures, job analyses also need to meet the professional and legal guidelines that were published in the UGESP. So the job analysis also is dictated by law, the types of things we need to do or should be doing to make sure that we've got valid job descriptions against which all of our HR activities are going to be based on. So in planning our 
job analysis process, there are four major things we need to develop a plan for. So we need to be able to answer the questions for these four aspects before we can dive into the job analysis. Number one, how much time is it going to take? What resources will we need? And what resources are available for us? This way, if there is a gap between the resources we need and the resources that are available, we can make sure that we get those resources in advance so then we can dive in um, and, and start doing the job analysis. The last thing you want to do is start a process and then realize you're missing resources that you're going to need to do a job and then it's going to take you longer um, to do it. So when you know that you're getting ready to do job analysis on your company or in job families or whatever it is, make sure you develop your plan in detail in advance, know what resources you need and have a plan in place to have all those resources ready to go when you are ready to go with your job analysis. You also want to have some background information. It's really important to understand the history of your company, what it does, why it does it, what its culture is like, what its strategy is like. You need to know the fundamentals about what drives your company. Then you need to get into the details about the job and how this job contributes in the big picture to the organization's success and its strategic objectives. So. Um, we need to have old job descriptions. We need to know where it fits into the corporate hierarchy. Um, and we need to also go to places like ONET for more generic job descriptions to get a sense of what one should expect typically someone should do in a position um, um, that, you know, that we're investigating. So then we can compare the existing job description against the most up-to-date job description about what people should typically be able to do on the, on, in a particular job. So making sure we have all that background info before we start doing our analysis. Then we need to know who are they going to be the job experts? Who are they going to be the people that we're going to talk to? Um, if a job is involved with a lot of customers, then we might want to identify some key customers that we want to interview to find out what they need from individuals who are doing um, the job. You know, so that customer service aspect, what needs to be done. Then we also need to identify um, who else should be involved. Is it just the customer? Is it the subordinates? Are the, should, the, should the subordinates have a voice in what goes on for a particular job? Well, it does if the subordinates have a work output that influences the superior person's, um, the senior person's uh, work. So we need to know what the subordinates do to provide work for the more senior person. And we need to know what the senior person to that individual needs. So, um, and then peers, whoever is working with the peers. Um, so we, we, we may have a whole network of people that we need to talk to um, who are affected by or who affect the job output um, for that particular position that we're doing the job analysis for. And it's really important to remember, when we are talking to superior, superiors and subordinates and, and to customers, sort of like in a 360 format, it's not because we're evaluating the employee. Job analysis evaluates the job. It doesn't evaluate the, the quality of the work that the individual in the job, the current individual in the job is doing. It says, no matter who is in this position, what is it that you are looking for from that individual to do your job well? What, you know, how do they interact with you? Do they provide their work on time? You know, what kinds of things do you get from them? Um, um, and so it's important to know what we need from them and how quickly we need it and what the flow of work is going to look like. Um, so we need to identify all the key factors. So remember, it's not evaluating the individual, but it's evaluating what needs to be done and when and how and in what order and what is the, the, the expectation in terms of customer service or any kind of service in general, the interaction, what you can expect from that. Lastly, you want to make sure you're identifying which job analysis technique, as we discussed in, in a couple of slides ago, the kinds of techniques that we want to use. Do we want to use critical incidents? Do we want to use interviews? Do we want to use position analysis questionnaires? Any one of those are fine, um, or maybe several of them are fine, but we need to make sure we have a technique in place that we are ready to go and we have all the resources we need and the questions are ready to go so when we are ready to dive in, we have all the resources we need to do the job. We know how much time it's going to take us. We have all the background information in place. We know who we're going to talk to and who we're going to, um, who we're going to ask for feedback. And we know the tools that we're going to use to do that. 
Table 4.5 in your textbook outlines the 11 steps needed to perform a typical job analysis. This is not, you know, those rare, unusual circumstances, but on average, how many steps you should you have to go through to be able to perform a job analysis? And it starts as most everything does in the company when we're doing something that has a strategic impact is we number one need to get the support of top management team and ensure that all the managers are supporting the job analysis process so we need influence from the top management team and if HR is in the top management team that's great and HR can secure that information if not then HR is dependent on a more senior person to do that work for them. So it sort of depends on where your HR professional is in the corporate hierarchy, right? If they're at the strategic seat at the table, then they can influence that process and they're very likely to have all the cooperation that they need. But if they're lower down in the hierarchy, under accounting or under operations management, under finance, um, then more likely you're going to have to convince your CFO, COO, um, that this has to get done. So get that, always get your su support from top management because that then filters down to the rest of the organization. Number two, thoroughly communicate the purpose of the job analysis to all the participants and ensure they're diligent about completing the tasks objectively. And again, objective, we recognize that there isn't complete objectivity, that there's going to be an enormous amount of subjectivity that goes into how important it is, how often we do something, et cetera, et cetera. But that all can be verified over time. Um, at a minimum, we need to make sure people are aware of what we're doing and why we're doing it, that this is not being done to punish anybody, but because we recognize that jobs change over time and that new tasks and new knowledge, skills, and abilities sneak into the job and we need to know that the job description accurately represents what they do so that if we have to hire somebody new for that position, we've got an accurate reflection of what is, in, is involved in it and what the accurate KSAs are, because we have to keep them up to, date, up to date for legal reasons. Number three, collect background info and analyze how the job contributes to the execution of the firm's business strategy. So we need to know where the job fits into the corporate hierarchy. We need to know what role it plays hierarchically in terms of supporting functional strategy, business unit strategy, corporate strategy, you know, all the way up the line and making sure that the tasks that that individual has to do in this particular job is in alignment with the overall strategy of the company. Number four, we then generate the task statements, very similar to the way we create a task statement for um, your resume. It's the same sort of thing. It usually is an action verb talking about what we're doing, why we're doing it, how often we do it. Um, so it has a, a couple of key important elements to it, which we'll get into. Once we have the task statements written, we have to figure out what are the KSAOs, knowledge, skills, abilities, and other, that are needed to successfully do this job. Because from that, those KSAOs then dictate all the things that we do in HR, whether it's the kind of recruiting message in terms of what um, skills somebody needs to do a job, the, the selection tools that we use, the performance appraisal system that we put in place, how we evaluate um, the, the quality of the job and what it's worth to us, et cetera, et cetera. After that, we um, form the job duty and task groupings. And so we might have a, um, a list of 20 task statements, but many of those task statements could be grouped together. You know, there could be um, clerical work versus um, budgetary work versus something else. And so we might group them together in what is considered natural groupings of if you are doing budget work these are the skills you need to do budget work so you need to be good at math you need to be able to alphabetize something you need to be able to you know work on um, Microsoft Excel and generate reports etc cetera, etc cetera. so we want to have those uh, um, job those task statements and KSAOs grouped together appropriately then we want to make sure we're linking the KSAOs back to the job duties. And so we want to make sure that there's a clear link between those uh, job duties and task groupings and the KSAOs. And so if we're going to assess somebody on a particular set of tasks that they need to do, what assessment will help us to um, assess those KSAOs the, the best? We then want to look at critical incidents and what critical 
events occur in someone's job. Um, and then weigh your job duties, give them a weight. Um, some job duties are more important than others. Some job duties are, are done more frequently than others. And so we might want to look at, you know, how important it is, how much uh, is this to the job? Um, how much time do you spend on this? How often do you repeat these tasks? These are all important questions you'll be asking. Um, then we want to put together our job requirements matrix. And our job requirements matrix includes the task statements that are grouped together in categories, the KSAOs that are involved in them, and the relative weightings of these tasks, statements, and job duties and task groupings um, so that when we are um, weighting um, the importance of certain selection tools, we know that we need to have selection tools that address the majority of the tasks that people engage in on the job that we want them, skills that we want them to have when they come into the job. After we're done with that job requirements matrix, we can then move forward and write the job description in person specification, or as I call it, the job specification either way. So as I said, task statements have a specific structure. They're very similar to the kinds of statements that we would put in our resumes when we want to describe what we do in our jobs. In, in, in essence, your resume should come directly from or can directly come from your job description because it should be worded in a similar way. So the task statement has to have the what, the action verb. What do you do? You write, you mow, you supervise, you compare, you drive, whatever it is. Um, to whom or to what do you do the work? So I supervise employees, I write copy for advertising, I mow customer lawns, I drive the school bus, whatever that might be. Um, and then how do you do it? How do you accomplish that task? Well, um, if mowing, you could use a riding mower or a push mower. Or um, with driving, you know, do you have to have a school bus license or is it just a small you know, a passenger van that you can drive. Um, if, you're, if you're doing budget work, do you need to know statistics or basic addition and subtraction? Do you need to know accounting principles? Um, if you're writing, do you need to know to how to use Word? If you are doing budgets, do you need to know how to use Excel? Um, so all these things are important. Um, how are you going to supervise someone? You know, by working with them in the store, or are you going to be supervising them via, you know, hidden surveillance cameras? You know, that kind of thing. And then lastly, why do you do it? Why is this important? So I'm going to write advertising copy using Microsoft Word for placement in newspapers and magazines. That's why you're doing it. You're doing it to place your ads in newspapers and magazines. I'm going to drive a fuel tuck truck containing gasoline to work site by following all the safety procedures to refuel construction vehicles. I'm going to compare unit expenses with budget using basic math computation to ensure budgetary compliance. You know, so you can see how each step of the task statement is important. So when you are um, creating your task statements for your um, job description, I mean your job requirements matrix, it, your task statements need to follow this um, pattern, uh, the action verb, to whom or what it happens, how does it happen, and why does it happen. That needs to be an explanation for it. As our job analysis steps say, state to us, once we have developed our task statements, we need to start grouping them together um, appropriately. So basically grouping them together as part of larger category of job duties. So the example that they use here in table 4.9 is about a university professor. And this is one, this is an easy one that I can speak to and I'm sure you guys can speak to the same thing. You know, you have experience with this because you're in the classroom with your teacher. Um, so task statements would be the types of things that professors do in the classroom. Number one, they prepare syllabi using Microsoft Word to keep students aware of expectations and grading criteria, readings, and course goals. No problem. They prepare lectures in advance using appropriate software and media to communicate the course materials. And I'm sitting here um, in my office and I am recording my lecture on, um, on Microsoft PowerPoint so I can make them into lecture videos for you guys. And it's the same kind of thing. I prepare my lectures in that manner for my online classes. Um, 
Lastly, we lecture students verbally to accurately communicate the course materials in an engaging way. And if I was doing a face-to-face -face classroom, of course this would be part of the process. Um, because I am not teaching you in the classroom, I am recording my lectures instead. So I don't lecture to you verbally face-to-face, -face, I lecture to you in the context of the PowerPoints. So all of those are grouped together as the types of things that a professor would do to address their needs for classroom instruction. But as you probably know, that's not the only thing that we do. We, we, we manage things in the classroom, then we have to, to grade. We have to grade assignments. Then we have to do research. We have to have a research output and publications to demonstrate that we have mastery in our particular area and ongoing, lear ongoing learning and mastery of our subject areas. And we also have to engage in service, service to our profession through uh, participation in conferences and things like that. We need to do service to the university by serving on university committees and having roles on, on, in university jobs. Um, we serve our school, uh, maybe engaging in activities to support the school, and we serve our department, um, things that we do act actively um, you know, in the department to serve the department's needs. So there's multiple layers of service that professors have to be engaged in. So right now what you see in table 4.9 in this particular slide is a job duty only involving classroom instruction. It really has nothing to do with the things we do outside of the classroom, which is the preparation in advance, um, doing the lectures. I mean, that's in the classroom, but um, doing the grading, that's outside of the classroom work and then our research, and then our service. All of these are different aspects of, of our job as a university professor. We have to weight the importance of each of the um, task statements or the, the, the general job duties, right? So classroom instruction, how much time does a professor spend on classroom instruction? And that really is probably about half of my workload. Um, so if I spend, you know, 40 to 50 hours a week doing work, at least 20 to 25 hours is spent um, doing classroom instruction, and that includes preparation, grading, the recording lectures, delivering lectures, all those sorts of things. Um, so there's a couple of different ways that it could be assessed. Number one, you could do relative importance. You know, so if you had a hundred dollars to distribute, how would you distribute those hundred points? Right? This is weighted this. This is weighted this. And you could talk about how much time do you spend doing it. Now, don't assume that the relative importance of something is the same as the amount of time you spend doing it, right? Because we could spend very little time doing something, but it is incredibly important to our job. So um, we want to make sure we accurately represent how important something is and then how much time people spend doing it. Um, ideally, you know, they should be spending most of their times on the things that are most important, but there might be an aspect of their job that is very short in terms of the amount of time it takes to do it, but the impact it has on the organization as a whole, on my job, generally speaking, could be a tremendous impact even if it takes me very little time. So we want to make sure that we represent all aspects of this. Number one, it's, it's not just the, about the importance, but it's also about how much time I spend on doing that particular thing. This slide here is just a continuation of the previous slide getting at the same sort of things where you can see that relative importance, for example, of clerical work is 35 out of 100 points. So 35, you know, it's in terms of it's important, it ranks as like it's 35 out of 100, right? But you spend 50% of your time doing it. So you can see here's a great example of how it has a certain level of importance, but the amount of time it takes is a lot. And you could flip it and say something is really important, but I don't spend as much time on it. You know, you can have, you know, so there's, there isn't always a direct relationship between the relative importance and the relative time spent. Sometimes it's, it's not in proportion, so keep that in mind. So in creating our job requirements matrix, we have to take into account all these things that we just put together. We have to understand what our task statements are, group them together based on a general job duty. So this page in particular has project management and it has two particular tasks related to project management. Sometimes 
we have a bunch of tasks that are related to a particular job duty category and sometimes we only have one or maybe two so just keep that in mind that there is not a rule or thumb um, for how many tasks go into a particular um, job duty but you know honestly if you start getting larger than about five then there might be a way of parsing it out um, in, in, a, in, a, in a more discreet way but generally speaking you know one to five is, is, is a good rule of thumb then we have to decide what the relative importance of that is to the job and then how much time is spent on it. Then what are the competencies or the KSAs, KSAOs needed to be able to do project management related tasks. Lastly, we want to know the importance of the KSAO or competency to task performance. For example, in number one, the ability to develop plans and schedules. How important is that? Is it essential? Is it not essential? So for number one, it was a high importance. 8.2 is how it was ranked in terms of the importance of that KSAO. Um, the second one, time management skills. Not only was it a 9.1, but it was essential to the job. If you're not good at time management, you will not be good, a good project manager. There's no doubt about that in my mind. The third thing um, was knowledge of project management reporting software. That was a 7.6. It was important, but not nearly as important as the ability to develop plans and to have good time management skills. Um, so you could also learn project management software on the job, so it's not considered essential. And here is a continuation uh, again of the job requirements matrix. We went from project management skills. Now we have supervision, supervision skills or supervisory activities and customer service activities. Notice on customer service, there's only one item, but under supervision, there's two specific items. Um, the relative importance of the job, the relative time spent, the KSAOs needed, and then an assessment for each one of those KSO, KSAOs, how important it is, um, to do it and whether or not is it an essential skill that someone has to have to be able to do that job. So that is that means when you're flagging something that it's essential, that means you have to absolutely make sure when you are using your selection tools that those are the things that you will be assessing. Um, you absolutely have to assess for prioritization skills. Um, and the same thing here for uh, the customer service, listening skills was big. So you need to make sure that you're assessing for listening skills. 